Once again, my name is Miss Savannah. If you don't know me, I teach pre-K through fifth grade here at Resurrection um, for our religious education program. So we are gonna go ahead and get started with our teaching mass with Father Tyler, except for we have the real thing here. You wanna say hi, Father? I will. Hi, everybody. Good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, give everybody a few more minutes to get signed in and to join us. Um, just a, a, a note that uh, a lot of questions came in, wonderful questions from uh, kids young and old. So uh, we'll answer all those at the end. Uh, and if you have other questions or uh, questions on things that come up throughout uh, the evening, just go ahead and comment in on those. Uh, Miss Savannah will keep track of those and, uh, and we'll try to answer all of those at the end. Um, so once again, happy everybody's here. Thanks for joining us. Good to see everybody. And uh, we look forward to... Uh, to, to, to walking through this. We'll just give a couple more minutes for people to get logged in to, to join us and, uh, and then we'll get started. All right. Okay, it's, it's good to have everybody here. Um, as Ms. Savannah said, you know, there's a couple different ways to do this. Uh, you can do it as, a, as an actual mass, um, but I'm still a fairly new priest, so I, I think I probably get a little confused by that. So what we're gonna do is, is it's a teaching about the mass, right? So we're gonna go through um, first a couple things about what mass is, uh, and then we're going to talk about the different things that we use at Mass, the sacred objects that we use uh, to, to celebrate the Mass. And then we're just going to walk from the very beginning through to the end and explain what it is uh, that we do when, when we celebrate Mass. So first we want to talk about what, what Mass is. And Mass is, a, is first and foremost an act of worship. It's worship. And worship is the way that we show that something has value or has importance. It's special. We, we do special things, right? Just in the, in the way that when it's your birthday, you, you have a party, right? You celebrate that because that's a special thing. Or on Christmas, uh, you might have a celebration in the family because that's a special thing. And God is the most special thing uh, in our life, right? And so we want to have a special time carved out every week that we honor God, that we show how worthy, how important God is. And that's what worship is. So every time we come to Mass... It's a way for us to show how important God is. And there's something else that's really important about Mass, something that we do every time we come to Mass. So those of you who are preparing for your First Communion, you might also call it your First Eucharist, right? And I'm sure you guys probably know what that word Eucharist means. You probably learned this in your classes. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving, right? Or to give thanks comes from the Greek word, Eucharistoma. And what happens at Mass that we give thanks? Who are we thanking? We're thanking God. We're thanking God for what? We're thanking God for what he's given us. And God has given us everything. And so the Mass is the most beautiful way that God has given us as a way to thank him for the good things that he's given us. Now there's something really, really neat about the way that God does this. And it's that he gives us the very way to thank him. He gives us the, the thank you gift that he wants to, to receive, to, that he wants us to give to him. And that gift is his son. He gives us his son and we offer his son back and we give him Jesus uh, in, in the Eucharist, in uh, what the bread and the wine have become. We give that back to God. But every single thing that we have in the Mass, God gave us. And the prayers of the Mass, we'll talk about that later, but the prayers of the Mass talk about that, that God gave us these things, and what we're doing is we're offering them back to God. We're giving them back to God as a way of saying thank you. Now, because Mass is something special, because Mass is something sacred, we use different things. We use special things to be able to celebrate it, to be able to recognize that there's something different, right? I don't think anyone's living room looks like this, right? Your living room probably looks different. And I don't think that anybody, when you're hanging around at, hanging around at dinner, dresses like the priest dresses at mass, right? We wear special clothes. We use special objects. People probably don't drink, you know, uh, chocolate milk out of something as fancy as the chalice that we use for, for mass. So all of these objects are, are, are set apart. They're holy. They're because what we use them for is something so important, so special. So first, I'm going to get dressed as a priest would for Mass. 
right? Um, but I'm going to show you guys uh, some of those, those things that we use, uh, the, the, the vestments that we wear when we celebrate Mass, all right? So um, we've got a, a, a whole collection here. Uh, now, Miss Savannah said that our First Communion students already went over all of the colors uh, that we use for Mass. So when, when I go through these, I want you guys, uh, if you want to, you can comment in and tell me um, what uh, season uh, we, we use the color for, okay? So the first one is, uh, is white. And we've got two different uh, chasubles here. So this is the main uh, vestment that a priest wears. It's called a chasuble. It uh, kind of looks like a poncho, and, uh, and what it is, is it's essentially the outer garment that a uh, Roman official, a Roman uh, person would have worn, and uh, it's, it's what we still, still wear today. So this is a, a white one, and why don't you go ahead and comment in, what time of year do we use, do you wear, wear the white? Or what, what days do we, do we wear white? So you guys can go ahead and put a comment in on that. Uh, so uh, white is, is worn for the most important occasions, right? Because it's the most beautiful festive color. So we wear it for Easter, we wear it for Christmas, for great feast days of Mary, of Jesus, of, uh, of the saints. Uh, so, so we have white. Just before, so we're wearing this now in the, in the Easter season. Just before that, we wore this color here, purple or violet. And that color is worn for, uh, for what seasons? You guys can go ahead, comment in if you, if you know what seasons we wear uh, purple for. Purple is a color of penitence, of, of, uh, of sorrow, right? Of and preparation. Of preparation as well, right? So we wear the two seasons when we're preparing for big celebrations, which are Advent and Lent, right? And um, sometimes we wear a slightly different purple. Uh, we wear one that's more bluish. That's kind of a... Um, happier purple uh, for Advent, and one that's uh, a more somber purple, it's more reddish, uh, for, for Lent. The color we wear more than anything for, um, for a season, for, for the longest season, the, the, the biggest season of the year, is green. And what season is that? You guys can go ahead and comment in what season it is that we wear the green vestments. A lot of people were able to guess for Lent, so. All right, good. We're, 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 we're doing it. We're killing it. All right, so green is worn for ordinary time, right? And ordinary doesn't mean just kind of boring, right? Ordinary means in order, right? So it's the, the weeks in order, uh, and it's the time when we don't have another feast going on, another a season or, or celebration. So we wear green, which is a color that reminds us of hope. And lastly, we have um, two different shades of the same color. Uh, we have the one we wear the, the least, um, which is red. And, and we wear red on any feast of a saint who was a martyr, who shed their blood uh, for Jesus. We also wear red uh, on feasts of the Holy Spirit, uh, like Pentecost, which will be coming up at the, at the end of, of Easter, because the Holy Spirit is uh, oftentimes associated with fire, right? So red is a color of fire. Um, so today, the 23rd of April, is, uh, is a feast day, and it's a special feast day for me because it's the feast day of my patron saint. Um, so we will wear red uh, today because it's the feast of St. George, who was a martyr um, who died in 303. Uh, so we'll wear the red. Uh, so, there are so Father, can you explain why he's a special saint to you? He's a special saint to me because my name is Tyler George. Uh, so he is uh, my patron saint. Tyler, is, there is no St. Tyler, um, so uh, I have, uh, George is my, my patron, which was my grandfather's name, too. So, um, so what does a priest wear? Well, first, um, there's sort of, just like we have a, a t-shirt, you know, maybe guys wear a t-shirt underneath uh, our, our regular clothes, we have kind of like a, a liturgical t-shirt, right? And that's what is called an owl, right, which is here. But first, sometimes, uh, you don't always wear this, but uh, there's a, a vestment called an amice. And what this does is it goes over our head and it just covers up our Roman collar so no one can see our, our street clothes that we wear every day, right? And the other thing that it does is it keeps your collar from getting sweaty. So um, it has a practical purpose too, all right? So um, after you put that on, then you put on the owl, all right? And the owl is a 
full white. Uh, the, the word alb comes from the Latin word for white. Uh, and what the alb reminds us of is the first sacrament um, in our life, our, our baptism. So when we came uh, to the church, most of us as a teeny tiny baby, and we were baptized, at the end of the baptism, we were clothed in a, a white garment, and the priest or the deacon said, uh, see in this white garment a sign of your Christian dignity, a sign of your importance as a Christian. Bring that unstained to the kingdom of heaven. And so the priest wears this first because he is baptized. So the most important thing, the thing underneath um, all of, of, of who he is and everything he puts on is he is first and foremost someone who has been baptized. It's also why uh, those of you, maybe your brothers and sisters, uh, um, serve Mass, they wear this, right? They wear an alb. It might look a little different, but it's the same thing because they are baptized. So any person who's baptized can, can wear an alb because it's just a reminder of our baptism. So after that, um, we wear, just like we would in our usual clothes, we wear a belt. We wear a, a special belt. It's called a cincture. Um, and for a priest, it's a sign of the promises that we make, our promise of uh, celibacy and our promise of obedience, right? That we're, we're bound to that, kind of connected to that, tied to it, all right? The next thing that we'll put on is something you don't see because we wear it underneath our, our chasuble, but it's what's called a stole. And a stole is a symbol of, uh, of power or of authority, right? So... It's a, a sign of the, the powers that the priest has to be able to, to perform the sacraments. So a priest wears a stole um, when we celebrate Mass, but also uh, when we do anything that a priest does, right? So when we hear confessions, when we heard your first confessions, those of you who did that in the fall, we wore a, a purple one, right? Uh, when we baptize a baby, we wear a white one. Um, so it's a, a sign of our, of our power, our authority as a priest. Um, and you sort of just tuck it in so it doesn't, doesn't move around. Last, we wear uh, what's called a chasm. As I said before, we went through all the colors on these. Um, this one is, is red, uh, and it has little crosses and little symbols of the Trinity on the front of it. Uh, and this goes over top of everything. And there's a reason. Because this, this vestment... Um, is a sign of, of charity, right, of love. And so um, what the priest puts on over everything is love. And so the thing that people should see in a priest, in the way that he acts, in the way uh, that he uh, treats people, in the way that he lives, is, is love, that he should be a sign of the love of God. And so love, charity, covers over everything, right? It covers over our power, it covers over uh, everything that we, we do. So, I'm all uh, dressed as, as a priest would be uh, for Mass. I can't see what my hair looks like, but it's usually messed up after I put on uh, my vestments. Uh, so, we'll just have to live with that. All right. <laughs> so, we're going to move on now and just talk about some of the, the things that we use when we celebrate Mass. So, we're right here, and you'll see on the altar, they're usually set on the side, on what's called a credence table, which is like a little side table where we put all the things that we use at Mass. You'll see a number of, of the vessels that we use uh, to, to offer Mass, okay? Uh, the first thing is, uh, that's probably most familiar, uh, is, is what's right here, and it's called a chalice, right? And a chalice is uh, a special cup that is used to celebrate Mass, okay? And uh, this chalice is, is very special to me in a, in a particular way because it belonged to the priest that I grew up with. So when I was uh, uh, growing up at St. Philip Neri in Lenthicum, Monsignor uh, Zorbach was my pastor, and he celebrated Mass with this chalice that his family gave him when he became a priest in 1952. Uh, so when I served Mass as, as, as a kid, this was the chalice that was used when, when, uh, when I served Mass. And when I was uh, 
ordained a deacon, his family surprised me and they, they gave me uh, his chalice as a, as a very special gift. So it's very special, very precious to me. Um, but more precious than, than anything is, is what we use it for. That's why these things are, are beautiful. They're supposed to be beautiful. They're supposed to be pretty and, and important. They're, they're made out of uh, a precious metal, silver or gold, because what's more important than the, the chalice is what's in the chalice, right? What will be in the chalice, which is the, the, the body and blood of Jesus, okay? So that's the chalice. Now, there's also, there's a couple different kinds, but there's some kind of plate like you would have to celebrate uh, or to, to have a, a meal at home. Uh, so I have one right here that has uh, the little piece of bread on it, right? That's called a host, a flat piece of bread. Uh, and this is, this is the one that, that I use when I celebrate Mass. It fits right on top of my chalice. But we also have other hosts, right? So in here, you'll see we have more hosts. And, uh, and this is another one called uh, a patent. They're both uh, the same thing. Lots of words. Don't worry about that. Just, uh, just kind of to give you a sense of, of what we use. There are special um, cloths that we use, too, that are only used for mass, right? Uh, so the, the first one of those is what would be kind of like a place mat, right? Like you would have uh, at home. And it's called a corporal. So this is spread out on the altar. And the point of the corporal, and you'll see how it's kind of folded, uh, is that any little bits or tiny pieces of the host that might break off, they get caught here so that we can, can collect them and make sure that, that we consume them. Because even the little tiniest piece is still Jesus. So we have to be very careful, very reverent about how we handle that. Just like you might have a, a napkin at home, we have a, a special napkin, right? And we have fancy names for everything. Uh, so this is called a purificator because it purifies, it wipes clean. So you'll see uh, at Mass, after the priest consumes from the chalice, he'll wipe the chalice with a cloth. And that's what this cloth is. It's called a purificator. And there's a way you can kind of stack it all together. Um, the last one is uh, two, two more. Uh, on top of the, the chalice is what's called a, a pall, and it's just a, a there's a piece of a cardboard in, in the center here. Um, this has a little design on it, but what this was for was way, way back when churches had, you know, plaster that would kind of crumble or little, little bits of the wall would break off and they could fall in the chalice. We didn't want anything to fall in the chalice, so we would put a, a pall, a little covering, on top of the chalice so that nothing got, got into it. Um, it's really helpful now if you have a fly that's buzzing around the altar, you can put that on and make sure the fly doesn't wind up in, in the chalice. Uh, so, last couple things. Um, over here, we have two little, uh, little jugs here, what are called cruets, and one has uh, wine in it, right? red wine, and the other has water in it, uh, because these are all the things that we use at Mass, bread and wine and water. And uh, the last thing is a little bowl and a tinier towel, and that's used because at one point in the Mass, the priest will wash his fingers, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's all the, the, the vessels we use. Probably another thing I want to point out is uh, there are some books that we use, two books. The first is the book that the priest uses at the altar, which is right here, and it's called the Roman Missal. Now, it's not missal in the sense of like, you know, rocket missal. Uh, it's... Spelled differently, right? And what this is, is it has all of the prayers that the priest says uh, at Mass are, are, are printed here uh, for him to read or, or to sing. If we go over here, just for a second, uh, to, the, to the ambo, um, we can see that there is another book that we use that has the readings for Mass uh, called the, the Lectionary, right? And that's, that, that's over here. All right, so, um, going through all of this, um, we're now just going to walk through the Mass. Again, we're not actually celebrating the Mass uh, tonight. You'll notice I won't actually use the real words uh, when it comes to a very important time. Uh, but I just want to walk through, and as I do, kind of explain what the different things that we do are and why they're important, and maybe some things that you don't know are happening or, or little prayers that you might not hear because the priest says, says privately, okay? So, let's put this back.
So when we're, we're over in the church, usually the, uh, the, the congregation would, would stand up, right? Uh, everybody stands up. But before Mass even begins, there's something really important, right? And it's that we all gathered together. We came to one place, right? And, and why is that important? Because it means that we're, we're coming together as one family, that we're, we live in our, our own families. We're each uh, live in our own families, but we gather together into one bigger family, right? To, to be united together, to, to pray to God, to be able to show that God is important, right? to worship God, and to give God thanks for, for what he has, has given us. So, as we gather together, we, we usually will begin by, by standing up and by joining in, in singing, right? And singing is another way that we join together, that we have one voice, right, coming, coming together. As the priest comes into the altar, comes into the sanctuary, uh, usually he'll, he'll bow or he'll genuflect uh, either to the altar or, uh, or to the tabernacle. The tabernacle here in the chapel is, is right behind, right? So we would, we would genuflect, which means to, to bend our knee. And it's showing that this is important because Jesus is, is here in the tabernacle. Uh, he's still here, uh, even with, with everybody away from the church all these weeks. Jesus is, is still here uh, waiting for, for all of you. Um, so we would come in and we would, we would bend our knee as a, as a sign of respect to the tabernacle. And then the priest comes over to the altar and he does something that might look a little, little silly, a little strange. And he goes and he kisses the altar. Okay? And what he's doing is two things. One, he's showing that the altar is important, right? Uh, a kiss is a sign of, of affection, of love, right? And so he's showing that, that the altar is important. And why is the altar important? Because the altar is a symbol of Christ, of Jesus. He is in the middle of, of the church, of the community, right? Jesus is here in the middle of all of us. And so as he's, as he's kissing the altar, it's a way of, of, of greeting Jesus, who's, who's there uh, in front of us. But there's another reason, too. Because in most altars, and not, not in all of ours, but in most altars, there's a little tiny relic, right? So it's a little tiny uh, bone from a saint that would be in the altar. And so the priest is, is venerating, is, is kissing that to, to recognize and to, to uh, show honor to, to the saint, right? So... Uh, as, as the Mass begins, the priest begins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Mass begins like all of our prayers begin, because the Mass is a prayer. It's our greatest prayer. It's the most important prayer that we have. And we begin with the sign of the cross, which shows us two things. First, that we believe in God, who is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also, that we make that sign in the shape of the cross. Because we remember that it's through the cross that Jesus saves us from our sins. That he gives us, gives his life to set us free. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then the priest greets everybody, but he doesn't just say, good morning everybody, right? Because it's not a, a usual greeting, right? He uses different words. So we'll say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And everyone responds, and with your spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I usually don't respond to people by saying, and with your spirit. So, what does what that say? That the, the priest is saying, may God be with all of you. And the people are responding, with your spirit, meaning the spirit of your ordination. Right? That, that they're not greeting me just because I'm Father Tyler. They're greeting me because I'm a priest. Because the priest is not up here just as a, another person, right? He's here because he has a special mission. That's also why the priest wears different clothes, right? Because it's not about me or uh, how, how I am or what I'm like or what I like, uh, but it's about the, the role or the, the, the position that I have uh, in, in presiding over the Mass. So, after the greeting, uh, the first thing that we do is the priest will invite everyone to call to mind our sins, right? Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. And what he's saying is, as we gather together, we remember that, you know what, we, we make mistakes, right? We learned about this when you were preparing for your first reconciliation, first confession. Uh, and you know what, that's true of everybody. It's another thing that we all have in common. But before we enter into Mass, before we receive the, 
the Eucharist, before we hear God's word, we want to let go of anything that would keep us from being able to hear Jesus and being able to welcome Jesus into our heart. And so we call to mind the, the faults, the sins, the mistakes that we make, and we ask God for forgiveness. And so the priest will lead a, a prayer that expresses that. So, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. After that, there is a, a, a prayer of praise, of honoring God, right? Right from the beginning, we want to say how wonderful God is. And so during uh, that time, we'll pray the Gloria, this great hymn of praise that is the song the angels sang at Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. So on and so on and so forth. At the end of the Gloria, the priest says a prayer. And that prayer is called the collect, or it's spelled like collect. All right. And why, why is it called that? Why don't we just say opening prayer? Because what he's doing is the priest isn't the only one praying. Right? The priest isn't the only one at Mass. Right? There are other people at Mass. Even now, when there are people physically here with us, you're still all with us in, in the Mass. So the priest is saying, I'm going to collect all of the prayers that everybody's bringing, the, the things that they need, the things that they want, the things they want to tell the Lord. I'm going to collect all of them, and I'm going to offer them to God by saying these words that, that the church gives us. So, he says, for example, May your people exalt forever, O God, in renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Now, after that is done, we move into what's called the Liturgy of the Word. There are two major parts of the Mass. The first is the Liturgy of the Word which is reading from the scriptures, hearing about the wonderful things that God has done for us, his great love for us, how he wants us to live and how he wants us to love one another. And then the liturgy of the Eucharist at the altar, where we, we celebrate that love in, in a more profound way uh, in, in the Eucharist. So, Miss Savannah can, can pivot us over toward the, uh, the ambo here. All right, so... At this point, we have uh, the readings, right? And there are, at Mass, uh, usually four readings on a Sunday. The first reading is taken from usually the Old Testament. And so it tells us about God's love and God's uh, faithfulness to the people of Israel, right? To our ancestors in the faith. Then we have a special reading that is the psalm. It's called a psalm. And the psalms come from the temple. Uh, the, in the Old Testament, God's people worshipped in a really, really special place, the temple in Jerusalem. And there was a series of songs that they would sing, prayers that they would sing. And they're called the Psalms, P-S-A-L-M, Psalms. And so it's like the songbook of, of, of the temple. Then after that, we have a, a second reading, which is taken usually from one of the letters of St. Paul, who's uh, the patron of our, our sister church on the other side of the city. Uh, and then after those readings, the last reading is the most important one. So we all stand up, and we have a, a, a special song before a, an Alleluia, right? And that last reading, that most important reading, is the Gospel. So it's taken from either the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And so we stand to show that there's something different about this reading. There's something particularly important about this reading. Because those four books talk to us about the life of Jesus, what Jesus did, what he taught us, and how he taught us to, to love one another and how he taught us to live. So, after the gospel, everyone sits back down and we have the hamal. And so the priest, or the deacon, has a, a, a time to be able to talk about the readings, to try to explain uh, what the readings mean, why, why they're important, what they have to tell us, to teach us, why, why they're, what, what we might remember about them, what we might, uh, and something that we might be able to do. So that's, that is the homily. All of those things are really important because it's a way that God 
speaks to us, that he, he talks to us. A lot of us might be afraid about the Bible. The Bible is a big book. It seems kind of confusing. But there's a, a way that at Mass we hear it in a special way. And, it, and we're able to, to listen and to hear what it is that God wants to tell us. So, after the homily, the, the, the whole community will stand up and will say a very long prayer called the Creed. And what the Creed is, is a summary of everything that we believe as Catholics. What is it that we believe? In God the Father, in God the Son, in God the Holy Spirit. And that we believe that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit comes to us and we know them through the church. That we believe in the church and in, in the life of the church. So after the creed, this, this moment, we all stand together and we profess our faith, what we believe together. After that, we have what's called the universal prayer, the prayer of everybody. And this is where we, we pray for the Pope, we pray for the church throughout the world, for our our leaders and our government and our society. We pray for people who might have a particular need. Right now, we pray for all the people who are uh, suffering from the virus, the people who are caring to the, for the people who, who may be affected by the virus. Uh, we pray for, for the people who are sick, who are sick all the time. Uh, and we pray for, for those people who have gone back to the Lord, that the Lord would welcome them back home uh, to heaven. So, after each of those prayers, we, we might probably know that part well, when we say, Lord, hear our prayer, right? We pray to the Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Now, why do, we, why do we do that then? Because what's happening is, we're going from over here, where we hear God's word, over here to the altar, right? When we're about to, to offer to, to, to God, to God the Father, uh, the sacrifice of the Mass. So before we go over there, we want to remember what are all those things that we're praying for, that we're, we're offering up, right? And so we remember all of those things, and we, we bring them to the altar. Because the next thing that happens is something that has a great importance that we, we might not see. All right, so we come back over to, to the altar. And usually at Sunday Mass, you don't hear any of this, because there's music, and music is wonderful and, and beautiful, but there are uh, prayers that the priest is saying that, that are very special and, and very beautiful. So the priest takes, uh, takes the, the bread uh, here, um, sets it on the altar, and there's bread here. And then he says a prayer that's a, an ancient Jewish prayer. And he says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. What that prayer is saying is, God is blessed, right? God is wonderful. We're saying, you're, you're great because you have, through your goodness, because you're so good, we have received, we've been given the bread we offer you, right? In some way, God gave us this bread. Wow, God gave us everything, right? And then what's the prayer say? Fruit of the earth, that the wheat grew up out of the earth, work of human hands, we took the things God gave us and we shaped them and we made them into something good. Work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. That this piece of bread, which is just a piece of bread right now, this is not a consecrated, that this piece of bread will become bread of life, will become the Eucharist, will become Jesus' body. Likewise, he takes the wine. Now this is a prayer no one ever hears because the priest says it in a soft voice, or the deacon, if the deacon's there, the deacon will say it. So the, 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 the deacon or the priest will take wine, and they pour it into the chalice, and then they take the water, and they take a tiny, tiny little drop, and they just drop it in the wine. And as they drop that in the wine, they say this prayer. Through the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Well, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's a, 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 a symbol of what's, of, of what's happening here. So we have the, the wine, and we're taking water, and we're mixing it in with the wine, a tiny, tiny little drop. And it's a symbol of Jesus' divinity, his godness, right, who is mixing in with our humanity. 
that Jesus is God, God the Son, but he comes and he takes on our, our human nature, becomes human like us, right? Why? So that we might become like God, that we might live with God. And so this is a, a symbol of Jesus mixing in uh, among us. So then after that, the priest offers the, the wine, again saying, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. And then we respond, blessed be God forever. After that, the priest again says another prayer that you never hear. <laughs> and he says, uh, with humble spirit and contrite heart, when we be accepted by, accept with yoga, may our sacrifice be accepted with yoga. <laughs> this is, you, you can't do it when you lose track. With humble spirit and contrite heart, we accepted by you, Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. So what the priest is saying is, you know, I'm not doing this because I'm powerful, because I'm important, but you know what? I, I am, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm small. But you know what? With humble spirit, I recognize who I am and contrary heart, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done. May this sacrifice, what we're about to give you, what we're about to offer to you, be acceptable to you. May you take it. May it be good, right? Then the priest, again, remind, remember, reminds himself that he's a sinner, that, that, that we, like all of, all of us, uh, make mistakes. And so his hands are washed with just with water. Um, I'm not going to learn the lesson. <laughs> it says, wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Right? Wash away my sin. And so it's symbolized by washing our hands so that we can be able to do this holy, important thing. Father, what does iniquity mean? Iniquity, uh, it's, an, it's another word for our injustice uh, from the wrong doing that we, we do. Good, good. All right. So then the priest invites everybody, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Now, why does, why does he just say that our sacrifice, we're all doing it together, right? But he's saying my sacrifice and yours. Because what's happening here is that when the priest held up that piece of bread and offered it and held up that wine, that all of us, as we were praying through, through Lent, all of us are invited to take our prayers, our works, the things that we do, our, our struggles, our challenges, our difficulties, and we put them there on the host. And the priest offers that up to God so that God can change it, can make it something even more spectacular, even, even more awesome. So the sacrifice that's being offered is not only what's happening here on the altar, but the sacrifice that everyone who comes to Mass, or even the people you know, now who are participating through the Mass, uh, through, through live stream, the sacrifices of our lives, the, 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 the struggles that we have, right? And, and we, we give that to God so that God can, can make that something even more amazing, can transform that, okay? So, uh, after that, the priest says um, a, a prayer, and then he says a, um, a prayer that's talking about what's happening in the season. Right now we're in Easter, so we'll have a, a, special, a special prayer uh, for, for the season. Then comes the most important prayer. It's called the Eucharistic prayer. And if you look here in our book, we have all these little tabs here on the side, right? And this enables us to flip to it because we have a couple different options. Where there's, there's different prayers that we can pray. Some are long, some are not long. <laughs> so you, you might pick different ones for different reasons. Um, but uh, this is the prayer that uh, goes through and, and uh, gives praise to God, right? Uh, offers what we're, we're going to give God. But the most important part of that prayer is right in, in the middle. When we, we take the bread and we say the words that Jesus said at the Last Supper, right? Uh, and, and we repeat them, that take this, all of you, and I don't mean this, so I'm not actually turning this into Jesus, right? So, um, but take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. And likewise with the wine. Take this, all of you, and drink on. This is my blood. And when the priest says those words, by the power of the Holy Spirit, what looks like wine, what tastes like wine, what feels like wine, what looks like bread, what feels like bread, what tastes like bread, has been transformed 
into the body and blood of Jesus. But there's something that happens just before that that we might miss that is important. There's a, a gesture. So the priest's hands are usually like this throughout the Mass, right? Because he's, he's offering prayers. God is leading the people in prayer, right? But at a point just before he says those most special words, the priest's hands come down like this over the gifts, and he asks the Holy Spirit to come upon the gifts and make them holy. And what the priest is doing when he does that is he's not only saying, make these things, which he is, the bread and the wine, but also make everyone who's here holy, right? filled with God, filled with God's presence. So it's asking the Holy Spirit to come on the gifts so that they might become holy. And then when he says those words, they are transformed into the body of and blood of, of Jesus. After that, we have a, a longer part of the prayer that talks about who are we offering this for? What, what, do we, what, do we, what are we doing, right? Who, who, who are we remembering is here with us, right? That every time we celebrate Mass, heaven is here with us, right? That we do this uh, in communion with those whose memory we venerate, right? With all of the angels and saints, that we're, they're here with us, right? Because heaven has broken into earth. One other thing I, I want to say that I think is really important. We say the words that, that Jesus said, and when we do that, it's not just that we're kind of like reenacting, right? We're just kind of like playing like we're at the Last Supper again. But when we say those words, when we celebrate Mass, we're making Jesus' sacrifice happen, right? What does that mean? That seems, that's kind of tough, right? But what it means is it's a, it's a memory so strong that it's, it's, it's happening, it's real, it's, it's here with us. And so what is that memory that's so strong that has happened? Is Jesus sacrificed on the cross, right? That he gave his life over to set us free from sin, to free us from the fear of death, right? But not only his sacrifice on the cross, but also his resurrection from the dead, right? Which our parish is named after. His rising from the dead. So that wonderful mystery of suffering, dying, rising, and returning to the Father happens right here on the altar every time we celebrate Mass. Right? Sometimes you might say, oh, I, I, don't, you know, I don't get a lot out of Mass, or I might have trouble focusing or paying attention at Mass. But I think it's because we, we might not recognize just how amazing what is happening in front of us that heaven is breaking in, right? that we're joining with all the angels and saints, and that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is, is being made present right here in front of us. But then something even greater than that. After we, we finish the Eucharistic prayer, we join in praying the, uh, uh, one of the, the greatest prayers, like the prayer that Jesus gave us, the, the Our Father. And, and we recognize that we are the, the daughters and sons of God, right? that we are brothers and sisters to one another. Um, after that, before everything happened, we would exchange a sign of peace, right? Saying that let there be no division, no fighting, nothing that keeps us from, from one another. Why? Because of what happens right after that. That we come to the altar and we receive communion together. Before that happens, though, there's a couple little things that, that happen that you, you might not see or you might not know happen, right? The first thing that will happen is that the priest takes the host, this again, this is not consecrated, takes the host and breaks it, okay? Because Jesus did that. He took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave, right? So he takes the host and he breaks it, and then he takes a little tiny piece off of his host, called the fermentum, and he drops it in the chalice. And we do that because in Rome, our, our, our Mass is the Mass from Rome, right? We're Roman Catholics. And in Rome, the bishop in Rome is the Pope. Right? Pope Francis is the bishop of Rome. So in the early, early church, uh, everyone used to go to Mass with the bishop every weekend. And it was one big church, everybody went to Mass with the bishop. Well, then we got, we got too big, right? We got, which is wonderful. We got so many people, we needed to build other churches. And so they wanted to have some way to be connected with the bishop connected with the Pope, the, the Bishop of Rome. 
So the, the Pope would celebrate Mass, and he, they would take the host that he had consecrated, and they would break up little tiny pieces off of it. And they put it into, into little uh, gold containers, pixies, and then they would send out deacons to all of the parishes in Rome. And they would take a little tiny piece from the Pope's host, and they would put it into the chalice as a way of saying, even when we're celebrating Mass at this parish, we're still all together with, with our bishop, just like we used to be. And the same is true. Every time we, we celebrate Mass, we're, we're united as one family throughout our, our whole archdiocese. So it would be like if Archbishop Laurie sent out a little tiny piece of his host, which he does. But, uh, <laughs> so... Um, after uh, he takes that, he, he drops it in, and then the, the, the priest says uh, a, a secret prayer that, that um, is again saying, um, it's, it's him talking to, to Jesus, right? So he says, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit through your death gave life to the world, free me by this your most holy body and blood from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me always faithful to your commandments and never let me be part of it. Right? Again, it's a, a beautiful little private prayer that, that the priest is saying before receiving communion about never let me, let me never let me be away from you. Right? Keep me, keep me close to you. Then the priest uh, holds up the host and he says words that John the Baptist said. Behold the Lamb of God. Right? That this is Jesus, the Lamb of God, the one who, who washes away our sins. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those, blessed are, are all of us, who are called to the supper of the Lamb. And then we all say a prayer that um, someone in the gospel said, right? Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. I'm not worthy you should come to my house, but only say the word and my soul will be healed. Right? I'm not worthy that you should come into my body, and under my, the roof of my mouth, right? Uh, but if you just say the word, I'm healed and you can come. And he does. So, then the priest uh, receives the host and, and the chalice. Um, uh, and then, uh, after that, we'll go and distribute communion to everybody. Right? Um, so, after, um, after communion, the priest will, will purify, will clean all of the, the vessels to make sure every little piece is, is you know, uh, consumed. Right? Because the tiniest little speck is, is, still, is still Jesus. So it shows our great care, our great love for, for the Lord to do that. After he's, he's purified everything, he's, he's, he's uh, cleaned it all, then he goes and he says uh, a final prayer, right? So again, uh, he, he will say, let us pray. We all stand together and pray. He leads everyone in that prayer. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And then again, the Lord be with you. God be with all of you. And then the people saying back, and with your spirit, with the spirit of your ordination. And then he gives everyone a blessing. And then the priest, or if there's a deacon there, the deacon will say uh, one of four responses. But essentially, go, uh, uh, go, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Right? There's a couple of things you can say. But what is that saying? It's saying that at the end of Mass, we are, we, we have received Jesus into our, ourselves, or into our bodies so that we can then go out into the world to, to share the gospel, the good news that our, our God has, has risen from, from the dead, has conquered sin and death. All right, so I'm going to take a really brief break on the Savannah time to some questions. I'm going to take my lessons off, and then we're going to answer uh, some, some questions. So... Uh, there are questions if you are a First Communion or a religious ed student that you have to answer. One of those is, what can a priest do that a deacon can't? Um, and the big thing for the Mass is that the priest can um, consecrate the host. He can make it the body and blood of Christ. Um, and the deacon can't do that. The priest prays a special prayer. The deacon can proclaim the gospel um, and do the homily, because that's part of their ordination of holy orders. So... Whew, what a, what a day. All right. So, um, happy to answer uh, some questions. I know Miss Savannah was, uh, was keeping track of those questions. You see our cool stage lights that we're um, using. Mm -hmm. um, so, Father Tyler, sure. I feel like this is a good one for you. Uh, 
How come the priests sing some things and not others? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> basically, um, the whole mass really can be sung. You can sing the whole thing. Um, and you, you, you sing the things that are most important first, right? And you sing more things if it's a, a more important day, right? So it might be like, um, you know, when it's your birthday, you have like a fancier dinner usually, right? So you have something, something better to show hey, today's an important day. Um, but uh, you sing more things to show that something is, is more important. That's one way you can do it. Also, sometimes some priests can sing, some priests can't. So, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, you just got out of priest school. Did they make you practice? It's also called seminary. Yeah. It is called seminary. Did they make you practice uh, doing a mass? Yes. So our, we had a class um, when we were becoming a deacon on how to do the things a deacon does, how to baptize, how to witness weddings. Uh, and then uh, when we were uh, getting ready to become priests, we had a class on how to hear confessions and how to <laughs> celebrate mass. And so we had a, just like, you know, you'd have a class of other things where the, we went through and we, you know, learned all the, the things you're supposed to say. And then you have to do, you have to practice. Okay. Um, so we have little, uh, like, fake, uh, I mean, they're actual altars, but, um, like, practice mass rooms. Um, and then, like, the two weeks before I was ordained, um, I was staying with my family, and Father Matt Himes was at Sacred Heart Glendon. Father Matt Himes, Father Tyler's best friend. Yeah. He was uh, right down the street from my parents' house, so um, we would get together in the evening, and uh, they have a little chapel there, and we would we would practice uh, practice mass, and then critique each other, which is part of the fun. Um, so on that note, can you guys tell us some of the things that you do with your friends? Um, hopefully not judgmentally. Hopefully not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Father Tyler, here's a kind of more... Uh, Question that we need to be a little more careful in answering, but why can't priests be girls? Uh, yeah, so um, that there is a, um, you know something unique to each of us, right? There's something unique um, to to being a woman, and there's something unique to being a man, um, and and so um, each of us, because we're unique, are called to special different things, right? And and that that doesn't mean one's more important than the other. It doesn't mean that um, one is more powerful than the other, right? Um, we all have a a special role. And so um, when Jesus uh, called the 12 apostles, right, who were the first priests, um, he, he called men. Um, and Jesus had women right with him all the time, right? He had girls in his inner circle, right? Mm -hmm. The first person to witness Jesus's resurrection was a woman, Mary Magdalene. Um, and so women are, are, were, and always will be incredibly central in in the church, right? Uh, incredibly important in the church. Um, but there's just different things that we're, we're called to do. So one thing my husband always says is the women were always in charge of the money in Jesus's party. And mm -hmm. the one time that they weren't is when Judas was. That's so true. we all know how that was. We should have learned our lesson. <laughs> um, here's a more simple question. Mm -hmm. Why do churches use stained glass? Yeah. So, um, in, uh, in, in old, old churches, there was no glass because glass was really, well, one glass didn't really exist and then it was really, really expensive, right? So, um, and also because windows are not a wall, so they, they, they make the wall weak. So old churches are really, really dark. Um, and then in the Middle Ages, they came up with really cool technology, um, like cathedrals, right? And, uh, and what that does is you can have all this glass, right? So you can, it lets light in and it lets the church be bright. Um, but they just, they'd realized that they can make those, those windows have pictures, right? You know, uh, so they, they would make all sorts of pictures because people, a lot of people, most people actually couldn't read. And so if you wanted to know about Jesus, if you wanted to know um, about the church, um, you couldn't just pick up a book or go on the internet like we can today. So they needed to have a way to teach people about uh, Jesus. And so what do you do? You, you can't read the story of Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish, but you can make some windows have that scene of Jesus, you know, taking uh, two loaves or five loaves and two fish and, uh, and, and multiplying them. So it was a way of teaching, teaching people. And also it's beautiful. And um, that's one last thing I'd say that's really important is churches are supposed to be pretty um, because they are uh, a preview of heaven, right? And so um, when we step into a church, it's supposed to be like stepping into the kind of the, the, the middle place between heaven and earth. And so it's supposed to look like something you don't see anywhere else, right? Um, and that's why churches are, you know, 
It's supposed to be beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna answer a question while Father Tyler gets a chance to kind of catch his breath. You guys are coming up with really good questions here if you wanna look oh, through sure. some of them. Um, somebody asked, why do we do the little crosses uh, before we hear the gospel? Um, which is, we do them when we say, Lord, be on my mind, on my lips, and in my heart. And this is just a way to remind us that like, we give our lives to Jesus. So we ask him um, to speak to us in prayer, that we will be able to speak his words, and that we always know that he loves us in our heart. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Another question was, can we share this with everyone or how could everybody that goes to mass, you know, learn more about it? And so either share it on Facebook or a really good way is just to remember that we are all members of Jesus's family. We are all disciples um, because of our baptism. We've been given this call to go out and show everyone God's love. So especially during this time when you might be a little bit uh, isolated and not able to see your friends, maybe uh, Skyping or FaceTiming your grandma, who's probably kind of lonely right now, your grandpa too, um, sending nice messages, making cards for people. These are all great ways that we can um, share God's love right now. Yeah. Um, so a, f a few, um, a few other, some, someone asked a question about what we usually wear, our, our, um, our, our clerical clothes. Uh, so there's a little white piece here. <laughs> Uh, and lots, sometimes you'll see it's like a white all the way around. And it's, it's because it, um, sometimes we wear it on Sundays where it's a, we used to wear a thing called cassock, which is a full, full length black uh, robe. And, uh, and just like we do now, you'd wear like a, a dress shirt underneath that. And so that would kind of peek up um, above. And so it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a version of that. It's a stylized. Um, I stayed with a nun once mm. who used to say that it was like the GPS. So it's like uh, either the habit for the nuns or the collar for the priest was like, God's positioning system. People yeah. could always tell that you were a okay. follower of God. And it's, it's true. I mean, a police officer wears a uniform, a, a doctor wears a lab coat. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, when, when you're, it's funny when, when, when you're a seminarian, you, you sometimes will, you know, wear clerics. So you, you look like a priest, even though you're not a priest yet. <laughs> and uh, when we were traveling somewhere uh, for school, so we were dressed like this and people ask you for confession. <laughs> you're like, ah, I can't yet, but now I can, so people can come. Um, all right, good. I'm glad everybody um, enjoyed so much. There were a couple questions from earlier. Do you, yes, do you yes, yes. Um, so why at the start of Mass do we ask for forgiveness? Yeah, so um, again, I, I, I said a little bit here, but um, it's because we don't want anything to stand in the way of us being able to hear Jesus' word and receive his, his presence, right? And so our sins are like a little, little roadblock, right? And so um, when we, we get here um, to Mass, we, we remember um, that we don't want anything to get in the way. So it's a, it, and that, that moment at the beginning of Mass actually brings about the forgiveness of our, our venial sins, right? Our, our less serious sins. So uh, one of the other questions was, why do we ask God to enter under our roof? Yeah, um, because it's, uh, again, it's, it's a prayer um, that the, the centurion said to... Um, What's a centurion? centurion? It's a Roman soldier. Um, <laughs> so uh, he, he, it's, a, it's a prayer that was said, um, he asked Jesus to heal his servant, and um, Jesus said that he would go, and he said, you know, Lord, only say the word and my soul shall be healed excuse me um, and that's another important point a lot of a lot of times um, some people say that we don't like Catholics don't do a lot with the Bible <laughs> but um, there's the Bible is all throughout the mass and the mass is all rooted in the Bible um, why is the cross on the altar the cross is on the altar because the priest is supposed to be able to see um, the cross uh, because it's a reminder to the priest of what he's doing right that he is um, he's making that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross happen, present on the altar. So it's there as a, as a reminder to the priest. Um, um, okay, where do you get to improvise in the Mass? Um, or where do you get to pick things? Sure, yeah. I, <laughs> improvise is not exactly the right word, right? So um, there are options for, for a, a, a number of things, right? So um, there's a, you can pick a number of different prayers. So um, sometimes on a, you know, the Sunday, um, looking at the readings, um, you know, there might be one, one prayer that makes a little more sense than another. So I'll pick that one because, oh, there was a line in it that connected to something in the reading. Mm -hmm. um, there really, um, th the important thing is the priest is not like making it up on his own because um, it's not, the most important thing is it's not about me. It's not about Father John, it's not about Father Ray, right? It's about Jesus. And so it's not that, um, oh, we're so, you know, look, look what I can do, but it's about um, what, what we've been called to do, which is 
not to, not to be about us, right? But to kind of do, do what Jesus asks us to do. So the homily, of course, you can, you know, that's where you, you can. Oh, that was another freely. question. Mm-hmm. Um, do you write the homily all in one session or do you write mm-hmm. it over a couple days? Yeah. So usually the. Also, be- did you take a class on how to write a homily? Yes, we did. We had two, two classes actually. Um, so you have a whole year on that. Um, so what I usually do is read the readings early in the week, pray over the readings early in the week. And then throughout the week, it's kind of like, as I'm going through, you know, things, um, experiencing things that you're reflecting on that in light of the readings. And then usually like midway through the week, an idea starts to kind of percolate. And then what does percolate mean? Come, come, come up, starts to rise up in your head. Uh, and then, um, the Catholic school is starting to come out of them, you know? (laughs) And then, uh, usually like Friday or if I'm really late Saturday morning, um, (laughs) then I actually like map it all out. So awesome. Okay. So we are running out of batteries. So sadly we're going to have to end this, but we're going to end by saying, father, do you have any, um, special things that you could say to kids who might be a little scared because of COVID? Sure. Yeah. Um, first to say that, you know, if, if you're scared, that, that's, that's okay. Um, that, that's a, that's a real feeling. And, and, um, and so, you know, know, know that it, it's okay, but, but always remember that, um, you know, first of all, God is bigger than everything, right? Um, that there's nothing that he can't conquer. There's nothing he can't beat. Um, and so, um, you know, we should never be afraid, right? Uh, that we always have, um, uh, uh, someone there who's who's watching over us, who's who's protecting us, um, and beyond that, also you know know that a lot of people who are responsible for a lot of grownups who are responsible for taking care of people are doing everything they can to try to keep people safe, right? And so um, just just know that 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 they're doing that and and that they're going to make decisions to try to keep everybody safe. But um, definitely pray, you know, ask God to to help people who are sick, to help people who are suffering, um, and uh, um, yeah, so. Okay, so. Oh, sorry. Um, one question did come up about: Do we uh, consume the host in front of the priest, or when we take it back to the pew? Mm-hmm. Father John, particularly, uh, especially for your first communion, always asks that you put it right in your mouth when you receive it in your hands. And this is good because we don't want to be walking around or accidentally drop Jesus. So we want to consume it right away. Um, Thank you to everyone. If any questions didn't get answered, Susan, Kate, and myself will go through and uh, edit through or uh, answer anything. Thank you all so much, too, for those who jumped on. I know one of the questions about the relic in um, the St. Paul altar. I don't know if you know real quick. Oh, it's uh, St. John of Artemola. Someone said that. Okay, St. John of Mola. So who is the patron saint of mothers and doctors, I think. Yeah. So, So, awesome for that. And we'll see you next time. Bye.